I've heard storytellers say you should always begin at the beginning. And in an earlier lecture, I gave you a list of 10 things that I wanted you to learn this semester in order to master basic programming skills. And it doesn't matter what language you're trying to learn. The 10 steps that I presented to you are probably good for any language out there. That's certainly how I designed them. And the first step on our learning process, in this case, we're learning C Sharp with Unity, would be to learn about variables. You really can't do much in programming without really mastering how variables work. And so this is a good first step. Now you probably know something about variables from different courses. Certainly you've had an algebra course by now, so you know from algebra that a variable is essentially the letter X. It's always X, right? Or it's Y, or it's Z, or it's some abstract letter that refers back to a value that can change at any point in time. And that's not a bad definition for programming, but we like to take it a step further because when we're talking about variables in programming, we're really talking about containers for data. It's a location to store your data, your stuff. And I've got on the screen now um, a box just to point out that containers in the real world have shapes. Now, the box is a simple one. It could have been anything. It could have been a milk jug. It could have been a cylinder. It could have been a sphere. It could have been a wallet shape, whatever you would like to think of when you think of a container, something that you put things in. And so um, the next thing to consider is that when we're putting data into containers, the containers have a shape, but data has a shape as well. And so there are some fundamental types of data, and you can think of them as having different shapes. And when you boil it all down, there are really just three different kinds of data out there. There are characters and strings. Basically, anything you can type on your keyboard would be a character or a string. Secondly, we have numbers, anything that's mathematically viable. What I mean by that is if you add two things together and get a mathematical sum, then it's mathematically viable. If you add 5 and 6 together, you get 11, and those are mathematically viable. If you add 5 and the letter G together, well, you really can't do that. That's not mathematically viable because G is not a number. So numbers, I'm talking about numbers that are mathematically viable. And the reason I make that distinction so sort of plainly is that I just mentioned that characters and strings are anything on your keyboard that you can type. Well, if you look down at your keyboard, assuming you're in front of one right now, you'll notice that you can actually type numbers. And so it stands to reason that they can, they can be either strings or numbers. And just which one you're talking about depends on whether or not you can add them together. And we'll, we'll take a look at this a little bit later in detail to see what the practical difference is between the two. And then the last really, really simple type of data is Boolean. And a Boolean can hold one of two values. It can either be true or false. So those are the only two options. And so it is really the simplest and the smallest kind of variable that you can have. So at this stage, you might be thinking, what the heck? I've had another programming course, and there are a lot more types than just three. And I guess this is really just for those of you that have had other programming courses. And yeah, you are presented with more than three types. But if you boil them down to the the real just basics, what you discover is those are the three types and that those other types that you may have learned about or may have heard about in other languages or even in C-sharp, of course, is that they're just variations on a theme. So if we go back to numbers, characters, and Booleans, some variations on the, those themes might appear as these. And these are certainly not an exhaustive list by any stretch of the imagination. Every language has different delineations of what these different variable types can sort of fall into different buckets and different sizes and sometimes even different words for them. But these are very common ones. So we have integers, which are whole numbers. We have floats, which are fractional numbers, anything with a decimal in it. And then I wanted to put something up here that says longs and shorts because the two things that we think about when we're considering numbers are whether or not they have decimal points in them um, or not. Uh, floats have them, integers don't. Another thing we consider is do we need negative numbers? And I didn't put any of those examples up, but we'll certainly see some later in our lecture today. And um, that's whether or not you need negative numbers. So that would be signed versus unsigned. Unsigned means you can't have negative numbers, and that just gives you a larger range of numbers to work with if you don't need negatives. But the other one is longs and shorts, and I like those terms because 
you think of space when you think of long and short. Uh, short occupies a small amount of space, and a long occupies a large amount of space. And those are just really variations on integers. If you need a, a, you know, a standard integer on a 32-bit machine is around plus and minus four bill, uh, excuse me, plus and minus two billion, or if you don't need negative numbers, it would be zero to four billion. I'll, I'll say four billion and change. It's a little more than four billion. It's 4.2 and um, a few numbers after that. I, I don't feel the need to memorize them. I can look them up if I need to. But if you need something bigger than that, if you need something bigger than 2 billion or 4 billion, then it's time to look at a long. But if you really don't need anything even close to 2 billion, then you can use a short and save yourself some memory space. And that's my first allusion to what we're actually talking about when we talk about space. It's how much memory something will take up. It's generally considered a good thing to take up as little memory as you need. You don't want to use too much all right, so those are variations in numbers, and certainly there are many, many, many more than that. That's probably the, the area where you have the widest range of variations is how you express numbers in programming. The other two are usually a lot simpler. And so we have, for character types, we have strings, chars, uh, and then we have a couple of other considerations that are similar to what we talked about in numbers. So a string is just a collection of characters, and then a char, short for character, although we say char, not care. <laughs> that would be strange. We say char, and a char is just one single character. Now, in C-sharp, you don't really usually worry too much with chars, the way you would if you've had a C or C++ class. Uh, they have some pretty serious distinctions between strings and chars, especially the older style of C and C++. But um, in C-sharp programming and the programming that we're going to be dealing with, I doubt you'll ever need char. There are only one or two places where they even pop up. But there is a distinction between them. So one character is a char, many characters is a string. And sometimes we have to distinguish between single versus double byte strings. Where that comes into play is when we start talking about internationalization. I teach this course, obviously, in the United States, and we use the Latin alphabet, which is pretty simple, 26 characters, some numbers, some punctuation. It doesn't take a lot to represent our language, but there are other languages where it does take a lot. So Arabic, Chinese, Japanese, um, actually Japanese probably isn't that bad, but some of these uh, languages that have a lot of characters in them, you couldn't really do anything with 26 characters. You need more than that. So single versus double byte just means how much information you need to store a single character from a particular language. And then more along those lines, we used to have a code that, that would represent all of our letters, and it was called ASCII. And ASCII code really just assigns, literally it assigns numbers to letters. So let's say, I don't remember exactly what they are, but let's say A is 32 and B is 33 and C is 34. And then you have a separate set for capitals uh, capital A might be whatever the next setup is, 50-something, and you get the idea. So each one of those is interpreted as a number. And again, that's great if you have a Latin alphabet and you don't have that many characters to deal with. You just have some punctuation, and then when you learn German, you have to deal with umlauts, and you learn French, and you have to put the little symbol underneath the C that makes it look like a 5. And there's just slight, tiny variations, but not that not that many. You don't have to worry about it that much until you start getting into languages that don't use Latin alphabet. Again, going back to Chinese, it would be simplified Chinese, obviously. Uh, Korean alphabet, uh, Japanese alphabet. Japanese have th two different alphabets and then Chinese characters. They have hiragana, katakana, and uh, the use of Chinese characters. So they have different variations even within their own language. And in these cases, if you want to represent all the world languages that are possible, you need a much, much larger register of possibilities than ASCII can provide you. So uh, somewhere, I think, in the 90s, we came up with something called Unicode, and that allows us a much, much larger range of characters that we can access directly. Instead of just forcing the world to use a Latin alphabet, we can now represent everything, every character that can possibly be represented um, is representable within Unicode, and that's the idea behind it. So I, that was a lot, but really, for our class, characters, very easy to work with. They're just going to be strings most of the time. 
And then the last type that we have to worry about are Booleans. So again, Booleans are pretty much true and false. Different languages have different variations that you can use. For example, some variants of the basic language allow you to use yes and no instead of true and false. And pretty much all languages allow you to represent a Boolean as a zero or a one. So a couple of different possibilities, but not that many. And Booleans, again, are the simplest type that you can deal with. So let's go back to the notion of numbers. There are lots of different kinds of numbers, and this is true of every programming language. They, they have lots of, again, delineations depending on size, whether or not you need negative numbers, and how much space they're going to take up in memory. So the most common one is, and there's the number that I don't memorize, I look it up if I need it, uh, is an integer. You're going to see this in C sharp. It's just an int, I-N-T, short for integer. And integers can go from negative 2 billion, I say 2 billion and change because that's a mouthful, right? 2 billion, 147 million, et cetera. All the way up to positive 200 and, or 2 billion and change. And again, that's just something that's easy to look up. And you just have to remember that, you know, as your numbers start approaching 2 billion, if you need to go bigger than that, or if you think you'll ever need to go bigger than that, maybe you should use a, a bigger type like a long. Um, as mentioned, an unsigned integer is the same range. If you look at it, you just take the negative range, negative 2 billion, and you shift it into the positive. And now you can go from 0 to four point, roughly 4.3 billion. So that's just, it's the same amount of memory, same amount of space, same range. It's just shifting all of those negative values into the positive gives you a bigger range to work with. Okay, we have some variants on numbers called bytes and s bytes, and those are really tiny. We have shorts, which are also, they're bigger than bytes, but smaller than integers. So you see where I'm going with this. There are different sizes, and you can just sort of pick which type that you want to use based on the range that you need. Now, having said that, I, I'm telling you that the best idea is to use the least amount of space possible. I'll tell you that in practice, most programmers just go with straight integers, and they don't give it too much thought. So you're going to see that. You're not going to see people going through the exercise outside of school, I think, where they're trying to figure out, well, should I use a short or a byte or a double or I mean, unless they need all that extra room, they're probably just going to go with an integer unless they need decimals. And in which case they're going to deal mostly with floats. And in this class, we're dealing with unity and we're dealing with game development and almost everything in unity is done with a float and a great many things have a range simply between zero and one, which is again, going to be a floating point number by design. So you're going to see a lot of really, really tiny numbers with lots of decimal places in Unity development. But you need to be aware that there are all these different kinds and ranges, and the larger the range is, the more memory is going to be used by that particular variable. And going back again, reminding you, we're talking about a container, so you want a small container if you can get a small container, because that's more efficient. Okay, the next thing we'll talk about when we talk about types is biddedness. So how many bits are needed to represent whatever data it is that you're trying to represent? And we haven't really used 16-bit anything in a long time. Most computers that my students have grown up with have been 32-bit computers, and now we're starting to get into 64-bit computers. And I suspect in five years, you won't be able to buy a 32-bit computer any longer unless it's something special. So 64-bit is too big. Most of the time we use 32-bit integers because, again, we don't need an integer that is as large as that unpronounceable number that starts with a 9 and ends with an 808. Too large, too much memory. You're going to actually slow performance down uh, in your game development if you try to go with 64-bit integers. So most games are developed and actually published as 32-bit programs. And 32-bit programs will, by and large, run just fine on 64-bit machines. But all you're really doing is you're limiting how much room you need to represent numbers. And then there's 128-bit integer, which is astronomical in range. And that's really the only people who would need that are, are astronomers who need to represent distances and speeds and things like that that are just gigantic. Gigantic. 
Okay, so going back to our notion that variables have a shape, your variables and your data also has a shape. You have to make sure that your shapes match. So a variable has to have a shape and the data has to have a shape. And if those shapes are compatible, then you'll be able to store data in that particular type. So we have this picture of a square peg going into a round hole, which is sort of an old analogy. But if you think about it, that square peg would actually fit in that round hole if the square was actually small enough to fit through that opening. In this case, it's not, but if we were to trim it down, you could actually put that square peg in that round hole. It just depends on the size of the value. So in this case, the hole is the variable and the peg is the data. And if, if the data easily fit as they do with the round pegs into the variable, there's never a problem. But sometimes you're gonna find yourself trying to smash a few things together and literally put a square peg in a round hole. It can be done, you just have to be careful about how you go about it. So let's talk about how some of that stuff works. The first thing you need to realize is that when you're talking about containers and data shapes and all this stuff, um, there are two different kinds of languages and they differ in how they declare their types. So not all languages require you to declare different types as we've been talking about, talking about strings and integers and floats and these are all different types. Some languages only have one type and they just sort of magically try to convert things on the fly based on what you're asking your program to do. If a language forces you to, to specifically say what kind of data a variable will hold and what kind of data it can hold, then it's said to be a strongly typed language. If it's pretty much wide open and you can do whatever you like, uh, then it's a weakly typed language. And we'll see examples of both here in just a minute, but there is one more kind, and it's important to us because C Sharp is one of these uh, types of languages. It's sort of a newer paradigm for working with variables, and that's called implicit typing. And it's still a strongly typed language, but you can kind of fake it and make it look like it's a weakly typed language. And that gives programmers a bit more expressiveness, which is something that programmers like. They want to be able to express their programs with as little typing as possible, and they want to keep their programs short. So implicit typing sort of helps with that. So we'll take a look at all three of these as examples. So a strong example might look like this, and this would be valid c -sharp code. It would also be valid Java code. It would be lots of different kinds of valid code. And so there, there's a whole family of languages that look very, very similar, but c -sharp and Java are very close to each other. I mention that because a lot of my students have either taken Java or are taking Java concurrently with this course. And so a lot of things that you, a lot of things that you learn in either course will be compatible with the other. So Java and c -sharp are both strongly typed languages which means they require you to give a type to all the variables that you create. And so the format looks like this. We have a string, we're gonna call it foo, that's the name of the variable, and we're gonna initialize it equal to a string, which uh, is always denoted in c -sharp and Java with double quotes. So it would say string foo equals bar. So the, the key takeaway here is that first word where it says string, where literally telling it that foo is always going to be a string, and then we're going to go ahead and assign it a string, and that's good practice. Here's what a weak example would look like. Uh, something like JavaScript would allow you to pretty much just, you'd have the keyword var there, and that just tells it that it's a variable, but there's no definition of what the type is. So it could be bar now in quotes, and then later on you could change it to a six, and then it would be treated as a number. You can't do that in strong typing. You can't start off with foo being a string and then later it changes to another type. That is impossible in strongly typed languages, but in weakly typed languages, it's easy and even normal. And then, as promised, the implicit example looks exactly like the weak example. This is what I'm pointing out. We, use it, we have this keyword called var, and that just tells the program that it's a variable and then again the name. But in this case, it is actually strongly typed. What it's doing is it's looking at the assignment. It says, oh, you've assigned bar as a string to foo, and since you did all of this in one line, I'm going to assume that from now on, everything you assign to foo is going to be a string, and so it is a string. So behind the scenes, 
the the guts of the programming language are going to assume that whatever you assign to it first, that's the kind of type it's going to be. Now, if you think about this, there are, there are some inherent problems that might come to bite you later. If you need a large range and you initialize your variable to zero and you really meant it to be a long, then it's going to think that it's an integer when it probably should have been a long or something else. So it doesn't work every time and there are hints that you can give when you initialize your variables, but just realize that that is an issue, but that there are ways around it. And we'll see these in action when we start working in our labs with C Sharp and Unity. Ah, I said that already. Didn't realize I had a cool animation there. All right, so the next thing you want to consider is that containers can fit inside each other. So this is kind of cool. These dolls that you see, uh, they come from Russia, and I can't remember what they're called. It's a Russian word. But these dolls that fit inside of each other, this is slightly analogous, or analogous rather, <laughs> to what you can do with variables in C Sharp. So there are ways that you can make these different variables and values fit inside one another. We do this a lot in programming and it's called casting. So casting is when you convert one type or one value even into another type. It's a way that you can fit a string into an integer or an integer into a string, vice versa. It's not impossible, but there are some pitfalls. And this goes back to our nesting dolls analogy. So as you recall, I've told you that a Boolean is the simplest data type that you can have, and it can be represented as true or false, but it can also be represented as a zero or a one. Remember that zero and one, of course, are numbers, which means a zero and one can be any of the numeric types. It can be an integer, a short, it can, be, it can even be a float, and that's fine. So uh, we can fit a Boolean inside of a numeric type. Likewise, we can put a numeric type inside of a string. It loses its mathematical viability at that point, but we can actually move the data from numeric to string, and a string can ultimately be cast into just a generic object. And so it's possible to move up the line, but it's not possible to move down the line. So for example, if you're trying to cast down, you could cast down into a Boolean if from an integer, if an integer were say zero or one, but if the integer were five, there would be no way for you to cast that as a Boolean and be, have it really be meaningful. There are a number of methods in C Sharp that we use, and we'll take a look at these a little bit later, because again, um, casting is a very big part of what we do as programmers, so you're gonna see a lot of different ways to cast, and this will make, I think, more sense when we actually do it in the labs, so I won't go into great detail here, but you have to remember that casting is sort of the art and science of converting data between different types. So we're working with variables, beyond types, the next thing that we really need to consider is how we're going to name our variables. This is one of the most important things you can do as a programmer is come up with a good naming system for your variables. You want them to be easy to read and easy to remember and easy to work with. But there are some rules that you have to follow. For example, variable names have to be unique. You can't use the same name twice. Obviously, that would be confusing. I'll give you a great example. My name is Bruce. My father's name is Bruce, and I have a stepbrother named, ready for it, Bruce. Christmas can be a little bit confusing. If you get a package for Bruce, who does it go to? So it's the same thing here. Incidentally, um, I was named after my dad, so that does make sense, but um, my stepbrother, uh, he was named after his uncle, who is named Bruce. And so, again, it's interesting at Christmas, but... It would be better in your programs if you don't have this type of confusion because your computer is, is pretty dumb and it can't really understand which one you're talking about um, the same way a person could. So your variable names have to be unique. They have to start with a letter or a character, but not a number. So you can't have one that starts with the number eight and or the number zero or the number one, anything like that. But you could have it start with, obviously, any letter is fine any character like the dollar sign or the underscore. We use underscores a lot um, later on when we talk about object-oriented programming, so that's fine. And the other thing that I didn't, didn't seem to put on the slide, I don't think, is that you can't have spaces in your variable names. So you kind of have to run them all together 
and there are some tricks for that, which you'll learn about in the labs. The next thing is that the variable name can't be the same as a C-sharp keyword, or if you're using another language, insert language name here. So a keyword is just those words that are reserved for the language, and it's kind of like vocabulary words in a, an English language. So we've seen one, we've seen one called var, so you can't call your variable var because that's a keyword. Uh, anything that's reserved for the language is not legal to use as a variable name. And then lastly, we'll learn about functions in the next lecture, but just sort of store this away for now when we're doing function names, the, the rules are essentially the same, but they do cross over each other. So you can't name a variable the same as what you name a function, or at least it's a really bad idea to you get kind of mixed results with that. So you have to be careful not to name things the same. Okay, so those are the rules, and then there are some additional good practices that we as programmers like to follow. So it's the difference between the two. If I ask you on an exam about the rules, I'm talking about the ones I just covered, and then there's these good practices that these are just good ideas. These aren't the law. So you should always use long and descriptive names for your variables. Don't just use abbreviations. Don't say X and Y unless you're literally talking about points X and Y on a graphics display. Uh, don't say temp. Uh, just really, or don't use like crazy abbreviations for things because they make sense to you, but they won't make sense to anybody else. And sooner or later, somebody else is going to look at your code and probably need to come in and work on it. And it's better if it's really, really simple and straightforward as to what's going on. And for that matter, if you don't work on a piece of code for a year or so, you come back, you may not remember your crazy variable definitions and your acronyms and things like that. So spell things out. It's more typing, but it's okay because your IDE does most of the typing for you anyway. Don't worry, we'll see demonstrations of that later. But the point is use long and descriptive names for variables. Come up with a naming convention for your project and stick with it. Enforce it like it was a rule. So if somebody checks something in, some, does some coding, and they're not following the naming convention, you should probably have them conform to the naming convention so that everybody's using the same, the same convention. And for C-sharp, most people just stick with the same conventions that you learn in Java. So if you're a Java programmer, you'll be right at home doing C-sharp. And if you're a C-sharp programmer, you'd be right at home switching to Java if you ever needed to. So there are lots of other practices that we'll look at when we look at object-oriented programming later in the course, but that's a good start. All right, so that is your basic introduction to variables. Uh, let's go do a lab. There's a variables lab video up and go in there and explore that. And then you'll be ready to move on to the next section, which would be functions.